Good morning, Karen. Good morning. And I'm going to send Erin another email. It looks like she's joined. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I have 10.01, so I'll go ahead and get started with our webinar. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. My name is Emily Wells, and I'm the Northeast Regional Coordinator for the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee. I will be your moderator today, but before we get started, I wanted to go over a few details. We will be asking our panelists questions throughout the presentation, and we will also ask for your participation and feedback through a few polls or by offering your thoughts and comments in the chat box. If you have any questions at any point, please send those in the chat box as well. Our Senior Director of Education and Outreach, Caitlin Inslee, will be monitoring the chat box and then answering your questions as they come, posing them as additional questions to our panelists or including them on a list of questions that we will answer via email after this webinar is over. So I'm about to introduce our four panelists that we have on the line. Um, but as I do this, we are gonna launch a poll to ask you all to weigh in on what is your profession, just so we can learn a bit, little bit more about who all we have on the line. So we have four wonderful panelists joining us today from all three regions of East Tennessee. First, we have Robin, who is the principal of Sarah Moore Green Academy. And prior to this position, she was an assistant principal at West Valley Middle and Vine Middle Magnet. Second, we have Karen, who is a licensed social worker with a certification in trauma treatment, who teaches high school Spanish and American Sign Language. Next, we have Jacob, who is a mental health counselor employed by Johnson County Board of Education. And finally, we have Erin, who is the induction specialist for Hamilton County Schools. Whole Teacher Well Teacher is integral to the induction program and provides strategies of self-regulation and resilience for new teachers. And it looks like a lot of you have answered. Thank you so much. We have several teachers on the line, some support staff, and, and some people in post-secondary education and then some others. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and we will move on to talk a little bit about the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee. So the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of mental health awareness, wellness, and recovery in our communities. Our programs are spread throughout the East, Northeast, and Southeast regions of the state. We provide programs that educate and provide resources towards early intervention, recovery, and advocacy. And so now I'm gonna pass this over to our Southeast Regional Coordinator, Sarah Waldrop, to begin the presentation. Good morning, everyone. So thank you very much, Emily, for starting us off. Like she said, my name is Sarah, and I'm the Southeast Regional Coordinator for MHAET. Um, just to start out, I would love to go over what I plan, what we all plan to talk about today. Um, briefly, we're going to talk about some statistics surrounding teacher mental health. Uh, we're going to talk about some factors that are involved in the work-related stress that teachers go through, as well as um, the added stress of COVID-19 this year. We're also going to address how to start the conversation around teacher mental health and how to help yourself as well as how to find social support. 
um, and this does include asking for help for yourself and others, as well as what we can do on the individual um, and at a higher level to improve teacher mental health in our schools. Um, and lastly, we'll follow up with some resources for everyone. So to begin, I want us to talk about why mental health for teachers is so important, um, because it's not really a topic that is discussed as much as it should be, but it is very well known to all of us that teachers are very stressed. Um, that stress and the underlying emotions that come along with it can have a harmful effect on the mental health of teachers, and that's exactly what we want to look at today. So in 2017, a study done by the American Federation of Teachers reported that 61% of teachers stated work was all, always or often stressful. Over half of the participants of that study agreed they did not feel the same enthusiasm that they had whenever they first started teaching. This relates to another research study that we found that one in three teachers quit within the first five years of starting their teaching job. This also showed that 58% of teachers described their mental health as not good for at least seven days of the previous 30 days. And then back in 2015, this same question resulted in 34% of respondents that felt that same way. So that's going to be a 24% increase in two years alone. A study done last year in 2019 showed that one in 20 teachers reported a mental health condition that lasted longer than a year. And so um, for some teachers, this included one in five teachers experiencing panic attacks on the job. There was 56% experiencing severe insomnia and chronic sleep issues. And finally, 47% uh, stated that their personal relationships outside of work um, had suffered greatly directly due to their job. Next, whenever we look at some of the factors um, that contribute to this work-related stress, there's a lot that can be a part of it, and these are just a few. Um, but like we said, it's not really secret that teaching is stressful. And so whenever we look at the occupational hazards of being a teacher, work-related stress is number one at that, that list. Um, this stress can be found from an increased class size, meeting student performance objectives each year or the number of hours worked as a teacher. Um, other factors can be students who are unmotivated, students who behave poorly in class, as well as interactions with parents that you may have to have. Um, another notable stressor for teachers is the lack of input and decision making whenever it comes to the academic standards, as well as the curriculum and the disciplinary policies at their schools. And lastly, most teachers feel an increased amount of stress um, from their salary that is lower than that of similarly educated and experienced professionals, while frequently taking on the extra roles that take place outside of the classroom that may also carry a financial burden. All right, so this brings us to our first panelist question. And I would like to pose this to Karen first, since I know that you are currently a teacher in high school. So what other unique challenges and additional stressors do teachers experience that may be less common in other professions? Um, I think that a big deal is having very little adult interaction actually during the day. Um, I think in a lot of professions, you have varying degrees of interaction with other adults, but to really not have any time to even just make an offhand comment to a peer during the day is different and that creates a lot more pressure um, about getting through the day. You also have a lot less physical space, um, especially for our elementary teachers. Um, children have a lot less idea of personal space, personal bubble than normal coworkers. Um, probably if coworkers in an adult setting were in your space and around your desk and taking your things and touching your stuff, as much as um, children were, we would be having a lot more work meltdown. So it's just a very um, different atmosphere with a lot less control over your atmosphere and a lot less ability to just have a conversation. You know, if, a, if a, an adult peer is doing something that bothers you, you can generally choose to have a conversation, but with teaching kids, you are teaching them how to uh, follow those social norms and things as you go. Um, I think a lot of professions, deal with similar, you know, especially service professions deal with um, lack of fiscal support. Um, but certainly teaching schools are chronically underfunded and that is has just been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, as well as not a lot of value for your intellect and professional capability. Um, you know, when we have even 
school board members in our entity saying that oh teachers got paid to do nothing during the spring when it was completely the opposite you know we were busting our tails to be frank um you know that's just it, it cuts um but i think really the the thing that i'll keep coming back to today is the difficulty in setting role boundaries um when you're a teacher you are basically responsible for the mental health the physical health for you know the, the lack of funding you're making it up out of your own pocket um all these things outside of your control but anytime you try to set a boundary of you know i i have to protect myself here i have to reserve something so that i can keep going um it's you don't just get the backlash that you might in another profession of like oh, you're you know, not dedicated enough to the company or you're not getting your work-life balance. The backlash is that you don't care about kids' well-being. And that's intense. And I, I think that's one of the, the hardest things um, to set healthy boundaries because there isn't encouragement to do that. It's actually the opposite. Yes, thank you so much. These are all very insightful points. Does anyone else on the panel wanna weigh in? Um, I do. Um, one of the things, uh, and I would first echo everything she just mentioned. I see that and hear that from my teachers every day. But I also want to mention that compassion fatigue, especially when you're in a school that has um, that's low poverty, um, low social um, socioeconomics. Um, so many of our students are experiencing trauma. And then you add COVID-19, we're all living trauma right now. So we're, our teachers are working really hard on building relationships with students. Um, that's always been a priority, but the caring in, the, the caring for and empathizing with our students and their trauma is really taking a heavy toll on our teachers right now. Yes, thank you so much. So we're gonna move on to our next slide and you perfectly segued into that talking about the pandemic. So there's gonna be a poll that pops up on your screen real quick because we want to know from you all, our audience, what is your stress level this year compared to last year? All right, so looks like most people are answering more stressful or much more stressful, about the same for a few of you. So it sounds like we're all kind of on the same page that this school year has definitely added stress to our lives. So thank you all for answering those. That was great. And uh, like Aaron said, we are going to briefly talk about compassion fatigue here in a minute as well. Um, first, we're going to mention, talk about, dive a little bit deeper in some of the stress of COVID-19. Um, because another occupational hazard of teaching is disease transmission. And so this year, more than ever, that threat is a lot scarier, a lot more severe, because even prior to the pandemic, studies have shown that classroom services carry 27 times more germs than services in the offices of other professions. Um, so along with the threat of a weakened immune system from the amount of stress, getting sick is a large cause for concern uh, whenever it comes to our teachers this year. So with us being back to school while COVID-19 is still very heavily present, this is a larger fear that teachers may not have faced before. Um, outside of the health risk, COVID-19 has changed our classrooms significantly. Many of our schools are enforcing social distancing, wearing masks during the day, as well as increasing the amount of sanitization that needs to happen. So we know that this can be a lot for our students to learn um, whenever it comes to the new processes, but it's also an added stress on the teachers as they are the ones enforcing these new rules. Another big challenge for many of us this year is virtual learning. Um, that is completely new to a lot of us. This is um, a new way of interacting with the students as well as teaching the students. And it hasn't necessarily been ideal in many of the classrooms. So whether it be learning the recent technology or even just the basic relationship building that may be hindered by a screen, virtual learning itself has brought a lot of difficulties and frustrations for teachers. And this is just the stress of COVID in the workplace because we haven't even really touched on what may be happening outside of work. Um, at the end of the day, we are all human and uh, we can all experience decreases in our job performances due to the stressors in our own lives. 
uh, teachers are not immune to this. And um, therefore the increased stress that we have all experienced since the beginning of this pandemic is another stressor that teachers are facing. So this leads us into our next panel question, which I would like to um, start off by asking Robin to answer. So have you noticed or experienced an increase in teachers who are struggling with their own mental health this school year? Absolutely. Um, anxiety is very high um, in the school setting. There's extreme fatigue. I've seen excessive crying from teachers that I've never seen have a meltdown or breakdown. Um, many of our teachers had even before fall break had that beaten down look that they that we usually see at the end of May. And I think wearing a mask all day and, and the amount of talking that you have to do while you um, are delivering instruction has just exacerbated this. Um, the work never seems to get done. There's always more to learn. Um, our teachers are trying to find um, new ways to reach students, especially um, virtually. That brings its own set of challenges. Um, Teachers have really realized that they, in the virtual setting, that they don't really have control. The things that really, um, that they struggle with the most are the things that are out of their control when it comes to virtual teaching. Um, many of our teachers um, have admitted to seeking counseling, began taking anxiety medication, um, and just really feeling lonely, especially the virtual teachers. There's um, a minimum, there's minimum um, adult interaction. So it's, it's been a very difficult year and I can, you could just see it in the body language. You can see it on the face. You can see, hear it in the comments when we're um, still trying to have school, still trying to talk about instruction um, when, um, you know, teachers are just breaking down. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Erin, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I, I, completely agree with everything that Robin is saying. I, we see that as well, obviously. Um, we, in our district, uh, for the induction program, we do um, whole teacher, well teacher, which is um, wellness strategies, the why, what, and how of um, what's going on, how to um, practice self, um, uh, you know, emotional awareness, self-control, uh, self and um, things like that. And we were, we were hosting a session a couple of weeks ago um, about around our core values, to identify our core values so that we can really kind of focus on what's important to us and really keep that at the heart. And um, at the end of our session, we open it up to individual um, wellness counseling or small group um, discussions, depending on you know who wants to stay on the call. And we had a teacher that stayed on with us. We had a couple of teachers, but one in particular um, stayed on with us. And I mean, she was just in tears. And she said, I did this practice with you guys. And my core values are hope and joy and happiness. And I can't get there. I'm blocked. And she just started telling us all the factors that had, had been a deal that she'd been dealing with recently, you know, COVID, um, a school change, a job change, her position had changed five times this school year. We had tornadoes in our area last spring. She lost a student um, in a fire, just all these things that she was holding right, you know, right here, holding everywhere. And um, our facilitator, Jennifer Knowles, she's a mindfulness consultant who um, has contracted with our uh, school district for three years now. We're in our third year with, um, with working with her. And um, so of course I'm watching this, my hands are getting sweaty. I'm getting nervous because I'm facilitating the session, right? And I'm thinking, how do I, how do I address that? How do I fix this? I need to fix this for her. And Jen, our expert, stops her and says, hey, you can't. Your brain is blocking that. You're in trauma right now. This is traumatic for you. And, and, and you know, bringing awareness to that is the first step. Then we can work on strategies and we can develop some flexibility and some resilience and some endurance. It's gonna take a minute. And so you just have to, you have to accept that and you have to embrace it right now. And you can see this teacher's shoulders physically drop as like the weight and the responsibility of having to carry all that. And like the, the idea that she had, the story that she was telling herself in her mind that she was a bad person because she couldn't get there wasn't true, that she's experienced bad things. So, I mean, that's just one example of how our teachers are feeling more stressed and why. 
Yes, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. I think that a lot of people on the line can probably relate to that. Hey, Emily, before we moved on, um, I wanted to share something that one of our attendees wrote in the Q&A. Um, Lori Goff wrote about how um, teachers now are experiencing hypervigilance um, because they are extremely aware of their surroundings and can't turn off their thoughts. And it's what police officers experience, that sort of hypervigilance. And now teachers are experiencing that as well, that they're always on. I feel like it was appropriate to add along with what Erin was sharing. And that's literally what our brain does. It, it, you know, there's a part in our brain that scans for threats all the time. And if it experiences, if the part that holds on to it and, and keeps it, experiences it enough, then it perceives everything as a threat. And now everything's threatening and I have to protect myself all the time. And it's really hard to train yourself out of that and, and almost trick your brain into being okay with things again. Mm. Yes, thank you guys so much. All right, we're gonna move on into our next slide. Great, okay, thank you guys. So with all of that that we just talked about that the teachers are really struggling this year, um, we, we know that COVID has been a challenge to manage inside and outside the classroom. We know about the statistics whenever it comes to teacher mental health prior to COVID happening. Um, but we really wanna understand how to start the conversation around this more, um, because if there ever is a day that COVID is no longer a threat, the need to prioritize teacher mental health is still going to be extremely prevalent. Um, we wanna start this conversation and keep it going because the lack of discussion surrounded this, surrounding this topic has contributed to the problems we've discussed so far. Uh, most of the time we see these negative impacts as burnout, um, that physical mental collapse caused by being overworked, uh, those that experience burnout may leave their job, have severe lack of motivation, difficulty performing, um, or even finding the desire to perform. Um, and also the threat of compassion fatigue, like we mentioned earlier, um, our students who have suffered trauma as their teachers, we want to set them up for excess, um, success, and that requires us to adre address the trauma daily. Um, so whenever we do this frequently, but we start to ignore our own needs that occur from this part of our role, it can cause us to become indifferent, um, emotionally withdrawn. And so this compassion fatigue is something we want to avoid because it can impact our own health in a negative way and not allow us to support our students' needs. So many of the teachers that we get to know through our work express to us a very large desire to understand the material that we teach to the students um, for themselves though. And so with the conversations lacking whenever it comes to the mental health of our teachers, these threats present themselves in a very large way. Uh, but the topic is kind of like the elephant in the room that no one really wants to address. Uh, this can be due to our own fears of being vulnerable to one another, or kind of like I think um, Aaron just mentioned, this idea as a teacher, you must always be on for your students all the time, and you feel like there can't be any room for you to admit something that makes you feel like something's off or like you need to turn off. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for bringing up those points. So we're gonna move on into our next question. And this is one that I also want to invite the audience to weigh in on through the chat. Um, and I'm gonna start by asking Jacob to give us his thoughts. What are some of the reasons that teachers may not talk about their mental health at work? There are a million and one different reasons why a teacher wouldn't wanna talk about mental health at work. And um, Sarah, you were addressing this a little bit in the previous slide, but th there's a, still a stigma around mental health. It's one of those things that we don't talk about because, you know, back in the day that meant that you were crazy, you had some sort of major issue, and they need to lock you up and get you out of this <laughs> out of this area. So there, there's still a little bit of stigma around that kind of stuff, and um, mental health in general is uh, it's a vulnerable space. Um, our internal space, our mental well-being is kind of like this sacred space where we're just like, this is me and I don't want anyone feeling around in there, messing things up or making things uncomfortable. And so um, a lot of times it can be really, really uncomfortable for people to open up and talk to anyone, even if it's a close friend or a family member and talk about these weaker parts of themselves. And in reality, it's not really a weakness. It's just you're, you're having trouble with something. You're struggling. There is something in your life that is difficult for you. And it may be super easy for another person. Um, 
but it is difficult for you and that's important to acknowledge that everybody has their strengths and weaknesses and everybody reacts to difficulties and hardships in their own different ways. And so it's important for us to open that conversation up with one another so that we can um, communicate and kind of lean on one another a little bit. Um, we're, not, we're not meant to function in a vacuum. We have other people around and it helps so, so much when we have um, the ability to lean on our friends, coworkers, family members, whoever it happens to be. Um, and that, that's super important. And the, the other reason that I think a lot of um, people don't talk about mental health, especially at work, is that we uh, teachers see a lot of hard situations with their students. They see, you know, the kids who have lost family, who have um, been abused, who are in terrible, terrible situations. And maybe we think, oh gosh, this thing that I'm experiencing right now is not near as bad as that. I need to hold it together so that I can address this thing with with this other person right now. And that keeps happening over and over and over again. And um, a teacher's personal um, struggles aren't ever addressed. They're always just giving and giving and giving of themselves until they have nothing left. And then that results in that burnout, that compassion fatigue. And it's, it's really hard. Yes, thank you for all those points. I think that goes back to what Aaron was mentioning earlier as well, just kind of the guilt of feeling the way you're feeling or the guilt of struggling and feeling like you have to solve your own problems. Karen, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, I think that we also, I, I really agree about the stigma and that that's exacerbated by the fact that you're responsible for other people's children. So you really don't want to admit that anything's off you know, because your priority is, you know, safety and well-being of children. Um, but I think that we need to start talking about toxic positivity in teaching. I think that is really prevalent right now. Um, if you're expressing concerns or identifying real problems, you can easily be labeled as negative or not a team player. Um, but, you know, we, we know as teachers right now that the math does not work out. We know that the social distancing math for students in a classroom that doesn't work. We know that the time required to wipe down desks between classes doesn't work. We know that um, washing hands with class passing times doesn't work. And yet we're being told to go into this environment with these safeguards that we know we aren't physically aren't going to happen and yet be positive about it and basically be in denial of the realities that we're facing. And I, I think that that both takes a real toll on mental health because you're kind of living in this parallel universe of um, having to deny what you know just to get through your day. Um, but then also there's not space. Um, you know, I think it, when Aaron was talking about just acknowledging this is the reality that we're dealing with, there's not space to say this is, this is the reality and the demands are outstripping the resources right now. Yes, thank you. Those are all really good points. And we're going to move on to talk about kind of what tools we have um, to help ourselves and help others. Uh, I'm sorry for chiming in, Emily, um, but I just wanted to add in before we moved on um, a couple of attendees, their answers. Um, an anonymous attendee shared that um, teachers may not share about their mental health uh, because they're fear about loss of administrative confidence and their mm -hmm. abilities. Um, and I definitely see that as a big barrier. Um, and then Kate said, uh, Kate Gallion said that um, something that they've noticed is that pre-COVID um, people would rally around teachers and support them. But now um, for them, it's almost become a battle to one up. Like, oh, I'm struggling more than you or who has it worse. Um, basically everyone is struggling. So it's a question of who's struggling the most. Thank you for sharing those answers and thank you to those panelists or for those attendees who posted those. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much. We're having some awesome conversation. Um, so we want to make sure that we do give you some kind of applicable skills to deal with some of this stuff. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is knowing how to help yourself. Um, we need to start or continue if you have been able to have the conversations about mental health and learn what we can about it, um, starting at the individual level. 
because at the end of the day, you know yourself best and you know what you need to thrive in a professional environment as well as your personal life. Um, so we're going to first talk about some of the signs of poor mental health. And when we look at the role of a teacher specifically, there are some warning signs that you can be on the lookout to identify in yourself as well as your colleagues. So first, you may notice uh, some mood changes happening rapidly. You may start to become more irritable and quicker to anger uh, with your students. You may also start to kind of avoid social activities. Um, and so this could even be like avoiding having lunch with a peer at work or turning down invitations to join in social activities outside of work. You also may notice in your conversations that you're frequently complaining, having negative perspectives surrounding your role or what's going on in your life. But warning signs can also exhibit themselves physically as well. So taking a toll on your sleep can lead to chronic fatigue. And I know that we mentioned um, those teachers who struggle with insomnia, but it can also result in changing your eating habits, uh, creating reoccurring headaches, stomach aches, uh, shortness of breath or chest pains and heart palpitations. So if you notice these signs in yourself, um, it is an indicator that your mental health is not where it needs to be. And so if it lasts for longer than two weeks, that's when you need to reach out for help. But one way you can begin to mediate these negative symptoms is by taking time for yourself. And as a teacher, most of the things we just spoke about occur because uh, you have such little time for yourself due to the demands of the role of teaching. And self-care looks different for each of us, but practicing self-care promotes long-term health and it will improve your mental health. And so for many of us, this is going to be a new habit that we have to force ourselves to do as a part of our daily routine. So this means you've got to write it in your planner and you've got to prioritize that 10 to 30 minutes that you get to have for yourself each day. Um, and by doing what you need to do to focus on your well-being. So we're going to ask you all to participate in the chat again and tell us how you practice self-care or in other words, what do you do to de-stress um, when you're feeling stressed? And I did want to comment on a couple of um, attendees who have sent some messages in our chat. Um, Juanita says that due to social distancing, teachers don't have the support system they once had. So you go in and close your door and not time for sharing with other teachers, no shared lunches or playtime. And I think that was kind of echoed by Elaine, who said we are discouraged from socializing during, before, or after work to maintain social distancing. Um, and the expectation that Zoom can replace that is Zoom's just not the same. So I think that the, thank you both for sharing that with us, because I think that that shows the uh, increased difficulties that COVID has posed just to uh, our ability to vent to each other and spend time together. And as you all send in your um, thoughts on how you practice self-care, I'm going to move on into our next panel question. And this one, I'm going to start with Erin, if you don't mind weighing in. Um, what can teachers do to support their own mental health, and how can teachers best support each other during this time? Sure. Um, I think what's most important is to recognize that being mentally healthy isn't being bulletproof. It's, it's not that you're you know, I, I'm tough, I can get through all of this. It's that you can be flexible, that you can build resiliency, um, like a rubber band, right? That I can stretch and then come back. I can experience something hard, sit with it, feel the feels, like get into it for a minute and then employ a strategy to not get stuck there. Um, and, and that's something that I think without the right um, approach can be oftentimes mistaken as buck it up, buck up buttercup. Like I saw in the chat box and that's not, that, that won't work. Buck it up, buck up buttercup won't work for us. <laughs> we have to feel it. We have to validate what we're feeling, what we're going through, but not get stuck there. And I think that's where um, those specific strategies come into play. Um, it can't be lip service. It can't be something like, oh, give yourself grace, set boundaries without teaching me how to do that, right? We don't teach, I wouldn't just give my, my teenager the keys to the car and say, go drive without teaching him how to drive. So if I want someone, if I wanna encourage someone to give themselves grace, I need to teach them how to do that or suggest how to do that. One way um, that, that you can give yourself grace 
is um, thinking about the expectations that we hold on ourselves or that others place on us or even just perceived expectations. The expectations someone may put on ourselves is not as big as we always think it is. It's our perception, it's our reality. And so instead of um, thinking and, and like getting down on ourselves about what we're not doing in terms of that expectation, flipping the script, taking a minute to look at what we are doing. That self-affirmation is, is really helpful in like looking for the good in that uncomfortable or crummy expectation that seems too hard to hold up, right? Um, and, and our brains will actually, they, they need, our brains need that, that good thought to look for the good in order to pull out of that. So that's, that's just one strategy um, that we can employ whenever somebody says, give yourself grace, or you feel like you need to give yourself grace, but you don't know how. <laughs> Yeah. And hearing you speak about that, she reminds me of what you all mentioned earlier with the toxic positivity, just like saying those kind of platitudes is not helpful when someone's truly struggling. And I want to turn to the chat for just a second because we have many panel or many attendees um, sharing some of their self-care practices with us. So Amy says she usually plays sports, um, but since those haven't been happening, she started crafting and making masks for her program and then expanding on the crafting, which I love. I think that starting a new hobby can be an opportunity to um, de-stress and practice self-care in a really positive way. Um, Christine says talking to friends, which I think we keep coming back to, having people you lean on in your life. Um, Kate uses the Bible app and has several devotionals, which I think is great. It's type of meditation and time to really explore your spirituality can be really helpful. And then Melinda, exercise and Netflix. Brandy also said Netflix, that's awesome. Mindful breathing is what Amanda said, which I think is really helpful too. So you all are throwing out some really helpful um, different self-care practices. Emily, um, in, our, in our whole Teacher Well Teacher program, um, like I said, we'd expanded it from just supporting our new teachers to um, our district, it's district-wide support this year. And it's just launching. So, you know, we've got a, a small group of, of, of um, committed folks that are, that are trying this out with us, and, but it's growing. And so every other week we offer up the how and the why, the, the sessions that really explore why our bodies are, are perceiving things the way they are and strategies that we can use. But on the alternate weeks, um, community members are offering up opportunities for us to take that time and space to practice self-care in, in ways that really um, feed our souls. So it might not be everybody's cup of tea, right? But last night, we it's, and it's Wellness Wednesday, <laughs> every Wednesday. <laughs> and so last night, we actually had an instant pot cooking class that ended up being so much fun. Oh, and that's I, awesome. <laughs> I thought I was so frustrated that I missed that I missed the opportunity to capitalize on the idea of depressurizing and being under pressure with the instant pot but it was fun the people that that joined us we learned time saving tips we had a yummy meal we got to you know laugh with one another and and it was great so just trying to look for those opportunities and knowing what it is that is your cup of tea that helps you replenish and then making making a point to do that no matter what that's really hard to do i i will speak from experience i am a work in progress with that. <laughs> yeah, that I like to say. Oh, sorry, Emily. Oh, go for it, Jacob. Go. <laughs> um, so something I like to say is that like adults need time to play to. And sometimes it looks a lot different from what, what kids are doing, but sometimes you just have to do something that you enjoy for no other reason than that you enjoy it. And that is really important to keep in mind for people is that you you live your life and you enjoy your life. You have things in it that fill you up. Um, kind of how I was saying before, like we're always giving and giving. Teachers have to give a lot. It's just part of the profession, part of the job. But you also have to fill yourself up so that you can keep giving. So doing something fun just for fun's sake is super important for everybody, especially for people in caregiving professions like, like teachers. Yes, thank you so much. I think that's an important point. We all need to have fun and de-stress. All right, and now we can move on to our next slide. 
Great. That was awesome, you guys. Um, so we are going to briefly talk about social support really quickly, because one of the many great things about being a teacher is the awesome people that you get to work with. Um, teaching is a profession that typically attracts some of the best, most outgoing, caring individuals. And so with this, you do have a large network at your school that you interact with each day. And social support is one of the top protective factors against mental illness. Um, it's good for you to have a few different colleagues that you can talk to throughout the day about things that may be going on, whether those be good things or those be not so great things that are happening. Um, but it's also critical to have someone to be a sounding board for you, because these are the people who can help you whenever you're having a difficult day or having a situation that's really starting to negatively affect you. Other teachers are going to understand your struggles. So having someone that can relate to the exact pressure and demands that you're under can be very helpful to your overall experience. But on the flip side, it's also really important to have someone outside of work that can provide some support for you from an unfamiliar perspective, because that can also be helpful. Um, having someone that you trust, that you feel comfortable with talking to about any negative emotions you have towards teaching or your job currently, um, having that friend or partner that exists outside of the walls of school can just add in another great support system and another sounding board for you that provides a different perspective. And lastly, we can also do our best to be someone that supports another person. Sometimes our own listening ears can be all that another needs to help improve their day and it can be beneficial to you too. Um, but it may be uncomfortable for some of us at first if we're not used to having those conversations about mental health struggles, especially with other people. So the best thing you can do is listen without judgment and offer the support that you have. Um, so one way I like to teach students uh, to get past that un uncomfortable feeling is this. Um, we've all had a friend who's broken a leg and must use crutches. So we open the door for them. We help them carry their books. We take a few extra minutes to walk slower in the hallways with them to make sure that they're okay and they get where they need to be. And so it should be the same for those friends of ours who are struggling with their mental health, because all it does is take a few extra minutes of our day to slow down and listen or help carry their load when we can. And like we just mentioned, mental health conversations can be really uncomfortable for a multitude of reasons, um, one of which maybe is just because we don't know how to respond. We feel like the only things we're going to be able to say are, I don't know. And that's kind of a common concern for many of us. Um, but you don't have to know all the answers, so don't hold yourself to that expectation um, because there's nothing wrong with you saying, I don't know. Um, this may even apply whenever it comes to your own mental health. Say you notice some of the warning signs we talked about earlier, but you don't really know why you feel that way or you feel guilty for feeling that way. Uh, we mentioned that after two weeks, it is kind of the time for you to reach out for help. And this reason is because after two weeks of those symptoms going unmanaged, there's a higher risk that the symptoms you're experiencing are symptoms of a mental health condition. And with mental health conditions, early intervention is key. So the sooner you get help, the sooner the symptoms will be able to resolve. So we want to focus on preventing those serious mental distress um, before it occurs, which means that you're gonna have to ask for help. And so one terrific way to check in with where you are in your mental health is by taking a mental health screening regularly. Uh, we'll paste the link in the chat box here and we'll also send it out via email. Um, but these screenings give you an idea of where you are with your mental health and they can help shed some light on some things you might not have known previously. So now more than ever, it is important to not ignore those uneasy, uneasy feelings and those negative emotions, um, because this has been a time of extreme chaos for many of us, and it's been a time of trauma. Um, and we want to make sure you develop those skills to manage the chaos inside and outside of the classroom. So moving into our next panel question and talking more about action items we can be thinking of, I want to pose this to Robin. What can be done at the admin level to support teacher mental health and decrease the stress that teachers are under? Well, that is a great question, Emily. Um, I wish I could say that I had all the answers, but I absolutely do not. Um, but this is a priority for me. Um, not saying that, I, that we're doing it right, but we have to be intentional with checking in on our teachers. So one of the things we implemented this year, um, every week we have professional learning communities where we uh, discuss instruction and talk about and, and uh, analyze student data and talk about what's happening in the classrooms. So each week we start with a check-in. 
So um, we had a conversation yesterday at our weekly PLC and we talked about, wow, you know, we are checking in and teachers are telling us where they are. Um, it looks different each week. We have some teachers that are at a level one maybe for the day or level 10 is, you know, I'm really stressed out and I'm not doing okay. But um, what are we doing to make sure we're checking back in with that teacher? We need to make sure we're intentional and go and, you know, maybe sit with that teacher at lunch or recess and just have a conversation, give them a place to um, release some frustrations and stress and also um, just let them know it's okay not to be okay. Um, I know when Aaron was talking about self-care, I was thinking about, um, you know, at the beginning of the year, we talked a lot about self-care. That seems to be the new hashtag word for teachers right now. Um, but what we realized is that many of our teachers didn't know the definition. They thought it was just all bubble baths and, you know, hot tea or whatever, or exercise. And that may not be everybody's thing. So we're really spending some time digging deep and talking about self-care really is more than just that. It is about recognizing and having that self-awareness that we're okay or we're not okay. And it's okay either way. Um, so we're just revisiting the definition and making sure um, teachers truly understand what that means. Another thing administratively that we're trying to do, um, teachers' plates are full. They are still, um, go we're still going through evaluations. They're still trying to prepare um, students for an end of the year assessment. Um, and that has definitely increased the workload. So we're trying our best to remove some things off their plates as much as possible. Um, and then, but the biggest thing that I've heard this year is teachers need permission. They need permission from administrators to set those, to help them and help them realize that it's okay to set those boundaries. Um, and I've got to do a better job myself because I'm at home um, checking emails up till 10 o'clock at night and that's not okay. Um, and I did hear an example that one school administrator in Knox County, um, the school decided as a school to, no longer check emails after five. And they said that the mental health and the attitudes and the morale of that staff increased tremendously. So it's just things like, just small things that we can do that we need to model for our teachers. Um, so if, if I tell my teachers, hey, why don't you just not check emails at night, then I need to do the same thing. Um, but also I think it's important that we just revisit our why. Um, we're in this profession because we are here to serve kids and families and the members of our community. We're not here for a paycheck. We are not here, um, you know, even for an assessment or a state test. So we just need to all, always go back to revisit our why. Thank you. I love all those things that you mentioned. That was awesome. And I think it does come back to just starting the conversation. And I love that you have that consistent weekly meeting to allow space for that. Karen, did you want to say something? I just really want to echo what Robin said about admin giving teachers permission is so crucial because usually we only hear when, oh, we didn't respond to this email within, you know, two hours or something. You know, we hear that side of it. And so we're constantly getting this pressure and especially with virtual now, um, it's, it's just exploded with this um, idea that we should be available all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most of us, you know, with one in three teachers leaving teaching, most of us that stay, we stay because this is such a core part of our identity um, that, you know, this is who we are. And so to not do everything and to do everything well is it's like it's compromising how we see ourselves, um, you know, as a person, in addition to what I keep saying about, you know, this is this is about kids and our, our care for kids. And so we very much need the permission from admin. We need the modeling of helping to pick out specific things like don't check your email after five. I think that's a great idea that, you know, we a lot of times get the opposite message. Um, and I think just, um, you know, as, as part of picking out specific things that you can let drop, you know, if you want self-care to happen that 10 to 30 minutes, that doesn't happen without something being removed from that 10 to 30 minutes. Um, teachers need help picking out, okay, what can I let drop? Because something's going to drop right now. That's just the reality we're in. We are not going to do the job that we want to do. And, you know, we have to hear that that's okay. And we have to work together as a community to say, you know, not everything's going to get done. 
what are the things that we're going to focus on for the benefit of our kids? Karen, I love that you you said what can we drop. It reminds me of um, a podcast that I listened to recently, and I cannot remember if it was Elena Aguilar or if it was um, someone else. Um, but they they likened all the things that we have to the balls that we juggle in life, right? And that it's not just that we have a work ball and a home ball and a, um, you know, a faith ball. It's that we have multiple balls in those big buckets and that some of them are glass and some of them are rubber. And so we have to prioritize. We have to look at all those balls and know which ones are rubber, which ones, if we drop them, they'll bounce, they'll be okay. Which ones are glass? Which pieces do we have to hold close and, and protect? And those are the essentials that we need to focus on and let the rubber balls bounce for a little bit, right? Um, there's kind of a crude analogy that I'm gonna share with you as well um, from uh, an instructional coach in our district who's also a marathon runner and she was part of a marathon group and she was really struggling with life balance, right? And the word balance is a wonky word anyway. Um, it's more about harmony because there's always a give and take. But at any rate, she was in a blog room and someone gave her um, the recommendation, y'all please forgive me for this, but it was think about the suck line and what you need to keep above the suck line. You know, that's such a crude phrase, but it's stuck with me. And sometimes those like absurd crude phrases are the ones that really kind of go, oh yeah, okay, okay. So what do I need to keep up here? And what's okay that it's kind of stinky, right? Um, so that's something to, I think, think about as well, just to remind ourselves of. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I love all these metaphors that you have. All right, and I think this moves us right into our next topic. Okay, great. So um, like we just said, teaching requires more emotional and physical energy than just any other average occupation. Um, but no one deserves to live a life that they feel like they are working to just get by and survive. And so whenever we get into this survivalist mindset, we can lose sight of the things that make our career and our lives altogether impactful and meaningful. And I think we've addressed a lot of that today. Um, because a lot of times, and maybe even right now, that energy and motivation may be missing. Um, and you might be fine you know, struggling to find peace, struggling to relax. And so we want our teachers to thrive for themselves first so that they can thrive for their students. Um, and this is going to require some of us to take a step back, look at these issues that we have and search for a solution, even if that solution is going to take time um, away from what we're doing, but it will help us manage the negative emotions that occur from the teaching position. And this brings us to our last um, panel question, and I'm going to have Jacob start with this one. But beyond simply surviving, how can teachers thrive mentally and emotionally this school year? So a lot of a lot of the things we've talked about are wonderful things that we can do, like setting boundaries, having good, healthy self care strategies. Those are all super important um, for thriving emotionally and mentally. Um, another thing I, I'm not sure, I don't think anyone's touched on yet, is that we need to be um, advocating for ourselves and for our fellow teachers, for um, administrators, you know, we need to be speaking up and letting other people know where we are and saying, like, this is where I am, this is what I need to thrive. A lot of times people, people know those things, but they're afraid to say it out loud because people will think that they're needy or they're asking way too much. Um, but in reality, it's a lot of the times it's not as uh, far fetched as you might be thinking, um, especially if there's a lot of people needing the same thing. Um, a lot of times that's how things start rolling. That's how you get the ball rolling to make some changes to make um, your environment a little bit more healthy. Um, and you know, banding together in that way. I, I think um, if teachers are speaking to one another, they find that they share a lot of the same concerns, that they have a lot of the same struggles. And um, when, when they're talking about those things, when these conversations happen, you know, you start brainstorming, you come up with some creative ideas. Um, I always love it when I hear about um, exciting programs that just seem like they're doing something like, wow, that is so cool. I would have never thought about that thing. And a lot of the times it just comes out from getting a bunch of people in a room and just talking about the issue. Um, people are good at solving problems if they feel like they have the agency and the ability to do so. 
Um, so I think that's a really important thing that we hadn't quite touched on yet. Would any of our other panelists like to weigh in on this? Um, I would just like to add um, now that I, I think I mentioned earlier that our teachers really have a lot of things that they realize they no longer have control of, especially when they are teaching virtually. Um, and I do remember last year we had a staff development and um, we had a donut. Everyone had a donut um, that they made and we wore it around our necks and we talked about keeping things in that center, um, things that we can not control. Um, and we just are constantly referring back to um, that donut and things that they can control and then helping them focus on the bright spots because really we want to spend, we, I guess it's human nature that we just spend our time focusing on the things that are not going well. So just constantly reminding our teachers, hey, what's within that circle of control and then focus on the bright spots. So that's really important this year. Yeah, I love that analogy. That is awesome. Um, and, and Angela, Leah also said she loved that as well. And um, there was a question that came into our chat box earlier in this um, presentation. I think Caitlin was going to pose to you all um, as an additional question. Yes. Um, so Roy Miller, um, basically what he said is, you know, this year has been a year where we can't really control things. Um, and he's curious about what we're going to do in the future what things are going to look like next year, the year after that, to make sure um, teacher mental health is prioritized, especially since a fix to coronavirus doesn't seem to be on the very near horizon. So I'd like to open that up to any panelists who'd like to share their thoughts. I think we've got to have the conversations. We've got to continue showing up and having brave conversations and transparent conversations. Um, another podcast I was listening to, obviously a podcast geek, um, said, she said something so profound. She said, we really hoped and thought that um, COVID would be the tearing down of an antiquated education system and a rebuilding, but instead it's been sand in the cogs of our education system. How do we change that? And so I think just like posing that to, you know, groups of people that can really brainstorm and come up with ideas that are sustainable um, because what we are doing right now is not sustainable long-term. So how do we make it sustainable? How do we, how do we get to a sustainable point? Um, so what has to be taken away? What has to be reimagined? Um, and and how, how do we do that, right? Um, I think that Robin really is, is, has illustrated how she's embodying that as a leader of her school. And that's one of the most important things that our administrators can do as, as, as they're charged with caring for their teachers. Um, there's a chapter in a book called Lead with Grace, leaning into the soft skills of leadership. And it's all about taking care of the teachers that really struggle. And um, it talks about wrapping them in a protective bubble wrap whenever they're struggling like that. And, and really like, not upping the ante and coming down on them for what they're not doing. That's not the time and place for that, right? Just like our kids that are stressed, it's not the time to address what they're doing at that moment. We've got to de-escalate it first. So we've got to protect our teachers in this time. And maybe that opens up space to think about creative solutions. I don't know what the solution is yet though. <laughs> And I, yeah, I think it's okay to, min to say that we don't have the answers, but just continue to brainstorm and try to find things that will work. I think for me, it's been important to say what I'm able to do right now does not reflect the whole me as a person. Like there are real limitations. I still want to do everything I can for my kids, but what's, you know, the result is, does not reflect what I would normally do what I would normally accept. Um, and that's my starting point. Um, and then as we go on, like Ro was saying, you know, trying to find a sustainable long-term um, to use a cooking metaphor, you know, I, I love to cook, but if I tried to 
adapt a new technique in cooking every single day and like all of a sudden become a gourmet cook overnight, which is, you know, we're trying to reinvent what we're doing. It doesn't work. And, you know, what I do to keep cooking fun for me is I'll, you know, do stuff that I've been doing for most of the week, but there's one recipe a week that I'm just going to like play around with an experiment and see, you know, something new, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. And I think we need to, you know, really, again, with administrative help to focus on what can we let drop or what can we, you know, play around with picking just one thing at a time to say, I'm going to try this new thing. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but there's space for me to try it. And it's okay that this other stuff over here isn't sorted out yet. And I think that can help teachers feel like they have a little bit more control as well. Going back to that issue is mm -hmm. if they feel like they have autonomy and the ability to innovate um, in their worlds, it can really just make you feel a little freer, make it feel less oppressive, the environment that you're in right now. Yes, thank you all so much. We have about a minute left, so I'm going to pass it back to Sarah to wrap us up, but thank you all so much for weighing in with all of those ideas. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much. We have some resources here listed out on this slide, um, but we're also going to be sending you a resource document that has these links, has some of the links to what we've been talking about today. Um, so you'll receive all of this via email. Um, but we would also just like to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much for our attendees. Um, this has been an awesome conversation that I'm very happy we've been able to have. Um, we have all the contact information here. But again, this is going to be sent out over an email, so you'll have references for it. Um, but feel free before you leave to drop any final questions in the chat box so that we can get them answered for you on the email. Thank you. All right, bye to our panelists. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And if you have any resources you want us to add to that resource guide, send them my way and I'll make sure they get to everyone who registered for today's webinar. Also, Caitlin, uh, we have a couple of people asking if we can share the video with others for the recorded version. Yes, absolutely. It'll be posted on our YouTube page and everyone who registered, including those who attended today, will get a link to that video and then they can share um, to whomever they would like to. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye, Robin. Day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.